what we want. Can't get rid of me that easy, let's just fix it. <laughs> Welcome to worship here at Canapal Presbyterian Church. Glad to see you all this morning. More glad than you know. What I was looking at last Sunday wasn't really nice. But uh, thanks for your prayers and your gifts and your concerns. So I'm back. The kids are fine. Um, update on my daughter since we're going to talk good news here quick. She's gained about 25 pounds, so I think we're going to make it. I think that's where we get. She still has some more chemo to go through, but seems to be on the upswing at this point. Uh, since we're celebrating, the capital campaign has gone over halfway. We're at $15,097. Good news, ain't that true? <laughs> uh, um, we do have some prayer concerns. Apparently, we have a couple of folks that have tested positive for COVID. Janet's not here this morning because her husband tested positive, and she will be going for a test Monday. So pray that symptoms are minimal and that her test is negative. Uh, Nancy is also dealing with COVID, a breakthrough infection. So keep her in prayer in her household. And I think that's about where we're at. Are there any other announcements from the congregation? Anything I'm Tom? Uh, the next item is a uh, work day. Uh, we'll start at 9 o'clock. Appreciate it if uh, anyone can come out. Uh, sure. Oh, come on, we'll get a little more anxious about that. Say, yeah! <laughs> yeah! 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 Yeehaw! We got a yeehaw. I think we're north again now, didn't you? Yeehaw! I was in Texas. You was in Texas? I was. All right then. Now, um, Remember, this is God's house that we're responsible for. So, we got a hand? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, just quickly, um, I know Veronica, I just got back a couple days ago, but Veronica's working on something with Family Promise. You'll get an email about that, and if you can help out and donate, whatever. Feel free to do so, we would appreciate it. And also I noticed on here, Elena, thank you Elena, uh, Magic Penny will be next Sunday. So please bring your Magic Pennies, or your dollars, or whatever currency you want, um, maybe not Bitcoin. And we'll, uh, we'll uh, you know, pass that on to Food for Kids Backpack Program. Thank you. All right, any other announcements? Did I see a hand? I thought I heard something. All right. Okay, we'll wrap this up. <laughs> if you have any other announcements, please get them to me and we'll make sure that the message gets out. Let us look to the Lord now in prayer. Father God, we're very thankful to be in a safe place to worship this morning. We're thankful for all that you've given us for life, strength, and health, for friends and family. For all those, Lord, that sit beside us. And we love, yes, Lord, we're even thankful for those that are not yet friends, and those who rub us the wrong way. It just shows that our nerves are still out there. But Lord, we know that you're always working on our behalf, that even those things that look like setbacks can be used to your glory. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of living this life with you, knowing that you have gone before us knowing that you're looking out for us, knowing that you will not let anything sneak up on us. But Lord, you know what's happening in each and every one of our lives. Help us this morning, Lord God, to give you glory and praise for our lives, for our health, for all those, Lord, that we come in contact with. We thank you for the blessings of this earth, for the peace that you give us beyond understanding. And now, Lord, we ask that you help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen. Can you have the bells, please? Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in a responsive reading for the call to worship. 
If you are weak and in need of strength, if you are feeling fragile or vulnerable, know that you are welcome here. Know that Christ beckons you here. Know that you are loved here. Our call to confession comes from Mark 9, 35. Jesus said, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Let us humble ourselves before God and confess our sins as individuals and as a community. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Holy God, we commit ourselves to service, but fail to have a servant's heart. We seek social status, not sacrifice. We welcome worldly success, not the humble path of Christ. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from the pressures of the world that keep us jockeying for position. Help us be servants of all. Please take time for silent confession. And all of God's people said, Amen. The assurance of pardon. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And now the young people's message. verses 1 through 12 and uh, they talked about restraint of pen and tongue and how important it is for us to for me to uh, be careful of what I say uh, to people because sometimes you just can't take it back once it's said it's out there and it's very difficult to walk it back a lot of times so I was going to ask you, have you ever <clears throat> felt like maybe you offended someone uh, by what you said to them? Okay, and uh, is there a way to, um, to mend that feeling that maybe you made someone feel less than? Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a way. We can, we can walk it back a little bit, but for me, um, I know that uh, when I first started teaching, uh, I had to learn this skill of restraint of pen and tongue. I had to be uh, respectful and kind to my students that I taught and their parents. You know, sometimes there would be conferences and the parent would come in and I would want to say, you're, you know, your kid's terrible. Your kid is, is I, I had to really search for words that would uh, be kind and respectful to them. And in the school where I first taught, I would watch videos on how to speak with students and their parents, and also how not to speak with them. Um, actually, I would practice with other teachers. Uh, once my unkind words through speech and pen were spoken, it was very difficult to rebuild that trust and the love that I should have shown in the first place. Uh, one of the things that I have learned through this gospel 
uh, last week's gospel is to always be careful of the words said and written because you can never take them back. And um, through the years, I have learned that um, to always lead with a kind word. You know, if I have something to tell somebody that's on my heart, um, that may be upsetting to them, lead with a kind word. There is always something good that we can say. Um, I used to use smiley stickers on the worst test scores because why not? You know, I would say things like keep trying and put a smiley sticker on it. Work even harder. But let the students know that I knew they worked hard, but give me a little bit more. And uh, I, I also say to myself, what would Jesus do? He would lead with a kind word. Um, and one thing that I try to do is to count to three before I speak or write about another person. You know, I can remember practicing that. What, one, two, three. Be careful of what I say and what I write. So um, that's my message to you today. Um, I have a prayer for us. Please bow your head. I come near to God so he will come near to me. I use my tongue to speak well of others. And um, an activity I have for uh, any child or anybody else in the uh, church that would like, I have some rocks here that um, I have a little marker and uh, I wrote some words like trust, be kind, and so I have a, a, a rock for you to write on. I have 10 of them, so if you're interested, you can spread the word. And this is another youth prayer activity because we've been focusing on how to pray. So I'd like to give you this and uh, Put them on someone's porch, okay? All right, thank you. Please join me in the prayer of illumination. With the reverent sense of your presence and your spirit's gift of guidance, we gratefully approach your word today, holy God. Help us meditate on the message you intend for us and be open to your life and be true. Amen. Our first reading comes from James chapter 3, verses 13 through James chapter 4, verses, verse 8. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do, do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you, sin you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded.
gospel reading this morning comes from Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to speak to you this morning a little bit from childlike greatness, which seems like total opposites when you first look at it. But if you've ever had a child tell you what for and what everything's all about, you know what I'm saying. Sometimes they have wisdom that we have already, over our years, denied and explained away. So what does it take to be great? We talk about being leaders. We want to be good leaders. And if we were honest with ourselves, most of us want to be great leaders. We don't want to be mediocre. And what does it take to be wise? From the time we begin to consider who we are and what we're here in this world for, we start to aspire to be great, to be wise, to be the best. And we encourage others to do the same. How many advertisements are similar to this one? Be all you can be. It doesn't say anything about just be as much as you could. Or the one that says, we're simply the best. Well, who wants to be simply the worst? <laughs> What parent tells their child, your destiny is to be insignificant? <laughs> We're socially wired to aspire to greatness. But our idea of greatness is often different than what God is asking of us. And if God has something different, what would be the cost of that difference? How can we be great in the kingdom of God? And what will it cost us? And then, could we pay the price? Many of us have wrestled with these questions for quite some time. It's not one you answer once and it goes away. And we're not the only ones with such questions. In fact, that's where the disciples were stuck this week. Who's going to be the greatest? How are we going to do that? And above all else, don't let Jesus hear what we're talking about. Did you ever have a van load of kids? And the guys in the back are having the discussion and they think you don't hear them? Well, if you have mothers or parents here, I guess I should say, if dads are just as bad, you hear things that they don't think you're hearing. And after a while, if they're whispering, you're really listening. And this is the situation Jesus finds himself in this day. He's got a bunch of guys that are supposed to be working with him that are still trying to be the best, the most important. They're not learning wisdom as Jesus is teaching it. Unfortunately, we still have some leaders in the churches, and I mean the church overall, that act this way. They have to be the best preacher. They have to be the strongest leader. They have to be the one in charge. And if it's not going their way, and we're not doing it their way, then they don't want to do it. And this is pretty much what Jesus was telling them in the beginning. You can't be that way. The one who wants to be the greatest in the kingdom has to be the servant of all. Now, does that mean to make house calls and do their dishes? Well, maybe if it's necessary. But what Jesus is telling them is your attitude has to be that of a servant. The one that is ready and willing to see the need and meet the need. Not necessarily the doormat type, but the one who has the leadership ability to make the individual find their answers. And you're the counselor type. 
You ever been to a counselor? All you hear is, how does that make you feel? <laughs> they want you to start stirring up within you what's going on to make you be honest with yourself, to look for the help where you need it. And I'll be honest with you, most of us hearing that question get pretty aggravated. Well, I'm paying you so much an hour, why don't you tell me what I need to know? But that doesn't serve the purpose. And Jesus is doing that with his disciples. He's giving them demonstration. He's walking it in front of them. He's teaching them how to act, but they're not getting it. And so now Jesus has to give them one more example. And he takes a child. And he says, if you want to get into the kingdom, if you want to be leaders, if you want to be the greatest, you must become as this little child. Well, I don't know about you, but children are usually ones that need a lot of help. Children are usually the ones that we're instructing. But you know, little ones in particular, once they get it, you're not changing their mind no matter what. And as Christians, we need to get to that point where we let go of all the nonsense we've drug along and get close to Jesus and find out what is it I'm supposed to be doing here. How many of you watch the old Kung Fu movies? Be honest. Do you ever notice the greatest teachers in the Kung Fu movies look like they couldn't fight their way out of a wet paper bag? <laughs> and yet, when they say something, it's like the wisdom of the ages has finally come to this young buck who thought he had it all. Sometimes in Christianity, we need to look for those sages, the ones that don't look like they have too much going on. Maybe they are over 50. But that means they got 50 years more experience than you think. Maybe you're 40. Maybe there's only a 10-year difference. But they still have more experience. Learn from them. Listen. A child will listen to grandma's stories. A child will listen to what's being said around them. And a child will learn from them. And how do you know they learn? They'll repeat that lesson back to you when you need to hear it. Church leadership is not an easy thing. Jesus is telling the disciples that you need to have this kind of openness. Listen to what all is at you, what all is coming your way. Sort it out. Keep the good. But did you also notice Jesus brings the child to him and the scripture says, wrap his arms around him. We need to get that close to Christ so that we can hear what's going on. So we can sense what it is God has for us. Some of us, and I did this for many years, so I've got the right to say it, want to straddle the fence to the point that we're just close enough to get warm, but not close enough to get involved. We get just close enough to God that we pray over our meals, or now I lay me down to sleep. But when we get to the point where God wants to really give us some wisdom, we back off because that's what it cost us. What does it cost? It costs who you are. It costs your personal agendas. It costs the things you really, many times, are not ready to give up. I have one granddaughter that, that she says, I have a Puerto Rican temper. My grandma said I can keep it. Why? Because it works for her. She has several relatives that won't mess with her because they know she's going to go off the handle. And some of us hang on to those little idiosyncrasies because they work for us. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's the pouting ones. You're 60 years old and you still pout and you don't get your own way. That's why you get in. And your husband gives in. Some of us have learned to manipulate certain people. We know who to go to to get the opinion we want. And we know who to quote to get our own way to the third person. I'll give you a quick for instance if you didn't catch that. The child that knows you're going to say no to where they want to go, Saturday night, 9 o'clock, mom says be home. So they go to dad. And the smart parent will say, what did your mother say? But most parents don't learn that way. <laughs> I want to go to such and such. Mom says it's okay. Okay. Make home, sure you're home by 11. Yes! They got two extra hours. They knew who to go to. They want a new dress. They go to mom. Mom will get the frillies. 
Maybe dad will drag them to the mall, but he's going to turn them loose so they can get what they want. We need to get close enough to God so that we hear what God is saying. Yes, I want you in by 9 o'clock. Okay, be in. Jesus has this whole life plan for us, and so many times we're busy hanging on to the junk we want to keep rather than letting go and getting close enough to God to hear what God is saying. The point of using a child is sometimes, especially in the Old, Old Testament, the child represented those who were forgotten. To the Hebrews, a, a male child meant who would have a heritage. But to most people, it just meant another nuisance, something else to take care of. They didn't have a high esteem for children. They were pretty much the outcasts. I don't think Laura was a woman. And that's the way they geared things. So when Jesus says, become as little children, he's asking also for you to just go ahead and drop everything and become the outcast. Maybe you won't fit in anymore. You take Jesus up 100% on what he's asking you to do, what to be as a Christian and as a leader. Because let's face it, there's somebody following you. If you listen to what God wants you to be, there's things about you that you're not going to have time to do anymore. Maybe some of those social circles will decide they don't need your Jesus stuff. Maybe you won't fit in as close as you did with some of your friends. And Jesus says you need to be willing to take that risk. You need to be willing to be the outcast to gain the wisdom and the strength that God has. How many of you ever told someone the truth and they were really thrilled about hearing it? Most times when you tell people the truth, the first thing they do is challenge you. And the second thing they do is say, well, you don't have a right to tell me that. We have to take a chance as a Christian to go out and tell people the truth. In love, in wisdom, you don't just go out and challenge them and get in their face. <laughs> Carolyn, I was right on the money. Sometimes you have to learn how to talk to people. You have to practice. But God is telling us, if you get close enough to him and you hear his voice, you'll speak to folks as God wants to speak to them. You won't be adding your two cents worth. James this morning talks about we have wars and fightings among us. And since he was talking to the church, I'm going to include that. Sometimes in the church itself there's a problem, not because leaders don't know what they're doing, but because someone wants their own way about something. They think their idea is the only way. And Presbyterians know for a fact that we have to come together and find a consensus to find what works for all of us. Not everything I do is going to suit you. Not everything you do is going to work for me. But together, there's someone in this congregation that can reach out to everyone. That's what God's telling us this morning. To use the wisdom that he's given us. To use the word that he's given us. To get close enough to Jesus. And stay there. So that you can hear what it is God desires from all of us. What is the point of arguing who is the greatest? You've already lost the battle. The epistle of James this morning talks to us about warlike differences. From our own agendas. From our own hearts. As we get closer to Christ, these things will go away as God deals with them. Someday, my granddaughter is going to lose that Puerto Rican temper. Because I'm praying that way. <laughs> and sometimes we have to pray for ourselves that way too. To let God into it. Our secret places. Those things nobody else knows about. That lie you stole back in second and told back in second grade that you feel bad about. Move in. Let God handle it. Forgive yourself. Forgive whatever was going on. And I may be the only one that carries anything like that or remembers those things. But if you have something that's holding you back that you haven't told God about, do it quickly. It's not worth waiting for. As we get closer to Jesus as individuals, then our relationships among each other will get closer too. Our tempers will settle. We may actually find understanding where there was people we couldn't understand before. 
We will grow this church body because people will want to know what's different about us. Look at those people, as diverse as they are and as different as they are, and they get along and they love each other. Others will be drawn to see what it is we're doing and what's working. Because let's face it, the world wants peace. I haven't met anyone that doesn't want peace. If you have, pray for them. So the invitation this morning is to reimagine in your own mind's eye what greatness means to you. Doesn't mean it's the biggest or you're the baddest or you're the best. That's the world's way of looking at it. But who is drawn closer to Christ? Who is willing to set their own humility aside and learn what God has for humility? To learn what it means to serve each other. To not be ashamed of doing something for someone else or hesitant. You want to grow this church? This is what we have to do. We have to grow closer to Christ. And then God will give the increase. So reimagine what greatness means this morning. Do you have the humility of a child? This is an invitation to be the person that God wants you to be, to gain the wisdom through prayer and experience. Not demanding your own way, not holding on to one or two little things that serve your purpose, but going all in for God. And that would be demonstrated in your lives by your own peace and your own humility. Nobody will have a question as to who you belong to. This is an invitation to create a safe space for all Christians and for anyone that walks in this door to explore their vocation in this world without judgment. This is an indication that we need to spend more time asking questions rather than giving somebody a churchy answer. Ask the questions. Let them think. One of the hardest questions for me to answer was a 15-year-old who came to me one time and said, how do I explain this to my class? They want to know why Jesus had to die. And this was a group of church kids. Sometimes we're so busy giving safe answers or traditional answers that we forget they don't know the traditions. We need to speak to folks on their level where their understanding is. We need to welcome other voices, other vocations, people that may see things a little differently. For me, the hardest one of that was liturgical dance. We had a church, and that's what they wanted to do. They had a dance, uh, a dance class within the congregation, and they were good. But it was really hard for the more mature folks to accept that there could be any praise and worship in liturgical dance. Now, I'm not bringing the dance group in, so take a breath. <laughs> but should that be, patience kid, but should that be something that we can have, or something someone would like to share with us, are we ready to let them do it? Are we ready to let people share their gifts? How bad would it be for a Presbyterian church to have a drummer on Sunday morning? What do you think? It may happen. Why? Because we're reaching out to other people and other cultures and other young folks, people that aren't exactly our age or our understanding, and we want to include them. But they'll bring their gifts, they'll bring their talents. And we need to find a place for them. And believe it or not, the group sitting here is the leadership of this church. None of you get off. I don't care if you're 15. You've been here long enough to know that God is love and God has different kinds of people and God has a purpose for everyone. And they will look to you to, does your church let people do such and such? If I wanted to sing a song, would they let me? This is how the new talent comes in and folks find their place. Not everyone is going to come in and be a mezzo-soprano. We may need a good boogie down bass. But if somebody comes in with that talent, then they can share. And if we welcome them with that talent or anything else, 
you will find that they'll stay because they found a place that is safe. Not because we know what to do with all their talents, but because we give them opportunity. That the leadership will stand up and encourage their hearts. Because I'll tell you, if we don't bring them in here, somebody will bring them into gangs out there. The minute they start calling them brother or sister, or saying, you belong here, they'll stay because they want that acceptance. And yet this is what Jesus is saying from the beginning. Don't keep your own agendas. Yes, we have a background, we have a tradition, we have things to start from, but we're starting from there. It's not the end all be all. Don't we say almost weekly that we're our church ever reforming? We're not gonna change the basic tenets of our faith. God will always be God, and Christ will always be head of the church. But we may change our worship a little bit. I'm imagining that when you first put the guitar music next door, that was a bit of an interesting discussion. And we're going to get that back, or can But all things to all people, Paul said, so that I may win some. And the leadership that is sitting here is going to have to open their minds a little bit more and be the great people that God's called you to be. To be the wise ones that can bring all these folks in and help them find a family. And I do mean family because if you stop and think about it, Thanksgiving dinner coming up, you're going to have everybody there. From the baby that can only eat applesauce to us old folks who can eat just about anything and now have to take medicine to do it. <laughs> And this church should look like that. We should have the babies crawling up the aisle. I don't mind. I had a church where we had one ADHD child that wouldn't listen to the sermon unless she was laying under the front pew. They're listening. We need to expand the horizons a little bit to make this truly a family of God. Young, old, rich, poor, crazy, not so crazy, totally off the wall, Talents that we haven't heard of. There's instruments in the band that I haven't heard of, but if they come here and want to play them, come on. Yes, we will keep order because we are Presbyterian. But everyone has a place. And if God sends them in here, then God has a purpose. So the invitation to you this morning, as crazy as it sounds, is get close enough to Christ to understand what it is he's sending our way. To understand what the new church is going to look like as we come out of COVID and people start looking for a place to be. To understand that not everyone has our experience. To it all them all in. And without losing our faith, teach them. Teach them what God really means. Teach them how much God loves them. And the only way you're going to do that is by demonstrating it. Don't be afraid to take the child on your lap. And if they're a little grubby and need their tissues, but go ahead, lift them up. Love them. Grandparents tell grandparents stories. Moms and dads help young parents. Kids help other kids. Let this be the Kool-Aid church where everybody finds something and comes in and brings the rest. But the first thing we must do is get close enough to God to hear what God is telling us. The invitation is to be all that you can be, all that God's called you to be, and to pray until you're so close that you can hear God's heart. Amen. Our affirmation of faith this morning comes from a brief statement of faith. We trust in Jesus Christ, holy human, holy God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor, and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed, and blessing the children. Suffering the depths of human pain and 
and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. Extend the invitation for the offering. With glad and generous hearts, let us return to God a portion of all that we have been given. Let us present our tithes and offerings to our God. The ushers come forward and prepare your hearts and minds. Responders, for those in the medical field, Lord, 
for the military and all those who stand in harm's way on our behalf. We pray for the families, Lord, of those, of those who have lost life to illness, to war. We ask, Lord, that you, again, be their strength and encouragement, be their comfort. We pray, Lord, for Alice as she faces surgery. Let things go quickly and well. Let the healing be complete. We pray, Lord, for the family that is going to be her help and assistance in this situation. We pray, Lord, for all those that are facing medical situations, for those that are fighting cancer, and those, Lord, that are facing end-of-life decisions. We pray for your wisdom and guidance. We pray, Lord, also in thankfulness for the blessings you've given us, for those you have raised from sick beds, for those, Lord, that you have returned to families after illness or injury. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've given us. We thank you that you're with us every step of the way. We thank you, Lord, for the skills of doctors and nurses and medical personnel to deal with situations quickly and expediently. We ask, Lord, that you continue to give them the strength as they face some rough times, some extended hours. We pray, Lord, for the individuals in this congregation, for members and friends, for new members and those who are coming yet. Keep them safe. Let them know where it is they fit in, what it is you have called them to do. Help them to hear your voice in their hearts and minds. Let there be no mistake that they are called to this place for this time, for this season. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've given us and your continued blessings as we become the church in this new generation that you've called us to be. Help us, Lord, to not only see the vision that you have presented to us, but to know how to work. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being part of the kingdom. And now, united as a family of faith and as the body of Christ, we lift these prayers up to you, God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Finally, hear us pray the prayer Christ taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of the earth. now, as we get ready to go out into that world, I remind you again to listen for the voice of God and draw nigh to God as he draws nigh to you. Welcomed into the embrace of God, renewed by the love of Christ, inspired by the work of the Holy Spirit, let us leave this house of worship to welcome, renew, and inspire others with the good news. And now may the blessing of Almighty God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend on each of you and remain in peace and power forever. Go with the peace that is yours in Christ. Amen.